So that goes over some of the behavioral a a aspects of what Paul is trying to advise us. So how do we receive these blessings and what would trip us up a little bit to receive the curses? I found something out recently. Again, I pray the liturgy at the hours in the morning and I did it uh, because one of my spiritual advisors gave me that as some advice uh, uh, quite a long time ago. And um, I found that when we're praying the Psalms, there's a lot of bless me, I promise you this, and all that. And I developed it into an us thing because I figured if my wife and I are one, I'm going to include her in all of this. So all of my prayers then have become, as many times as I can remember, and it's getting more frequent now, it's a we and an us, not an I and a me. So I'm asking for blessings for my wife every time that I pray. I did a Bible search on the words one another, and I got 105 hits. So a lot of them have to do with marriage. Uh, one of them has to do with some warnings that Paul would like to extend. Now these are general warnings, but I'm telling you they can apply easily to marriage. Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, for you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for flesh, but through love be servants of one another. You see how this aspect of service, it comes up over and over again in scripture. For the whole of the law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you, do, if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you're not consumed by one another. And I thought that went over for a long time, and I could see where, you know if you get in arguments and fights with people, if you don't stop, if you just keep going, two people get gobbled up. The one person that you're really running down and you, because you're doing the running down. So that's another way that you're stepping outside of that umbrella of protection that marriage affords for you. Um, I want to introduce one aspect of marital language that occurs in scripture only two times, but I think it's extremely beautiful. And uh, permit me to read those to you. One of them is in Ezekiel chapter 16. God is using marital covenantal language speaking to his people Israel. He's telling them I love you so much. I really wish that you would stay under this covenantal umbrella. I've loved you ever since you were an infant, ever since you were formed as the nation of Israel. And again, he uses this in a different language than we're accustomed to today, but nonetheless, it's easy to see. He said, when I passed by you and I saw you weltering in your blood, I said to you in your blood, live and grow up like a plant of the field. And you grew up and you became tall and arrived at full maidenhood. Your breasts were formed and your hair had grown, yet you were naked and bare. When I passed by you again and looked upon you, behold, you were at the age for love. And I spread my, my skirt over you, and I covered your nakedness. Yes, I plighted my troth to you, and I entered into a covenant with you, said the Lord God, and you became mine. See how sweet and beautiful the love is that God has for us. It's a marital covenantal love. Now he said, I, I spread my skirt over you. In the New American Bible, it uses the word cloak. And I'm glad I introduced this into the talk. Uh, in 1 Peter, he also introduces the same phraseology. Uh, I'm lying to you, that's not the one that comes up a little bit later, excuse me. Uh, it's also said in the book of Ruth, uh, interesting things about Ruth, I'll give you a couple of little factoids to go with it. There was a famine that occurred in Jerusalem and it was really long standing and people had to move out if they wanted to live. And it says in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. Now the man's name was Elimelech, and the woman's name was Naomi, and they had two sons named Malon and Chilion. Now Malon and Chilion weren't married when they left, but when they got into the land of Moab, the father, Elimelech, died, and the mother, Naomi, picked out Moabite wives for uh, her children. The two 
wives were named Orpah and Ruth. Now, one little tidbit, one little fact of you. Did you know that Oprah Winfrey is named for this Orpah? It's either her mother or her grandmother misspelled the word, and instead of coming out Orpah, they come out Oprah. I don't know, I thought it was interesting. <laughs> okay, well, as time went by, um, they only found out that um, the famine was over in Bethlehem, and she wanted to go back to her kinsfolk. So she told uh, Orpah and Naomi, you know, my husband, my husband's boys are gone, your husbands are gone, so, you know, if you want to stay here, that's okay, I understand. And Orpah said, you know, I will, I'm going to go back to my parents' household. But Ruth said, and this comes out of a, a song that I'm sure most of you have heard, that song comes out of this scripture quote, it says, Entreat me not to leave you or return from following you, for where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God. Sounding familiar? Like that song? Okay. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so and so to me and more. Also, if even death parts me from you. Well, anyway, Naomi and Ruth go back to the Bethlehem area. And in order for Naomi to continue her family name and to have an inheritance, she would need for her daughter-in-law, Ruth, to get a husband. And according to the Hebrew rite, she had to pick a husband that was very closely related to one of the two of her sons or her husband. So she said, go to Boaz. Boaz is a really neat guy. You'll like him a lot. He owns a lot of property, and it will go well for us if you can marry Boaz. So she, Naomi instructs Ruth, wait until after all the crop sheathing is done. And then after he's had his dinner and his drink and he goes to bed, slip in and just lay down at his feet. And when he wakes up, he'll tell you what to do. So at midnight, the man was startled, and he turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet, and he said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Spread your cloak over your maidservant, for you are my next of kin. Isn't that beautiful? She's using the same language that God did. Spread your cloak over me. And good advice for husbands, too. Cover your wives. Spread your cloak over her. Now, I was lectured the other week uh, at 4 o'clock Mass, and I happened to look up at those big standards behind the altar, those murals. One of them pictures what I imagine to be Christ. It's the tallest figure there, and he's right under the Holy Spirit. And he's got his cloak out like this, doesn't he? And he's offering that cloak to his bride, the church, to the 12 apostles. And I thought, boy, this idea of scripture comes back over and over, how important marriage is to God, how much he wants to cover us, okay? Man, good advice. Make sure you're covering your wives at all times. Now, the other one that I want to get into might deal a little bit more with the nasty side of it, and that might be some of the curses that come out of marriage, most especially as it applies to the husbands. And I want to go into first 1 Peter 3. Peter goes through just about what Paul went through, and that is advice to the wives first, and then he comes to the husband second. He says to the husbands, likewise, you husbands, live considerately with your wives, bestowing honor on the woman as the weaker sex, since you are joint heirs of the grace of life, in order that your prayers may not be hindered. Husbands, do you realize that if you are not treating your wives correctly, you are running the risk of having your prayers to God blocked. And just in case you think that that was an invention of Peter, let's go into Malachi. Malachi is talking to the men of Jerusalem and he says, Don't we all have one Father? Don't we all have one God that created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has been faithless, and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem, for Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob for the man who does this, any to witness or to answer or to bring an offering to the Lord of hosts. And this is the part that's most important. And this again you do. 
you cower the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor at your hand. You ask, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness to the covenant between you and your wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Has not the one God made and sustained for us the spirit of life? And what does he desire? Godly offspring. So take heed to yourselves and let none of you be faithless to the wife of his youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel, and covering his one's garment with violence. That garment that he talks about, that cloak, that's covering in love, not covering in violence. And he says, your prayers have been blocked because of the way that you've been treating your wives. Um, do you want to split here for a minute, Thomas? Sure. Okay. 